Corporation the had the opportunity the last week to attend a breakfast uh, from the Oregon Page Round Table Against Hunger in Portland. And Sylvia Hayes, the First Lady of Oregon, was the speaker. And she spoke, shared her story of growing up in poverty and, and uh, just very moving and powerful. But in the course of it, she, she quoted Senator Robert F. Kennedy, a uh, speech he gave the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And uh, I was so moved by it, I, I looked it up so that I could have a copy of the speech. Uh, the speech he gave at the uh, City Club of Cleveland. Um, and he spoke of another kind of violence besides the violence that takes the lives of people like Martin Luther King. <coughs> this is what he said. Uh, there's another kind of violence, slower, slower but just as deadly, destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference and inaction and slow decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men and women because their skin has different colors. This is a slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. And then he, he closed with these words. Surely we can learn at least to look at those around us as fellow men and women. Surely we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us and to become in our hearts brothers and sisters and countrymen once again. It's really in the spirit of what uh, we're trying to do with uh, Opportunity Village. And the first thing I want to say is strike the word camp from your lexicon. This is not a camp. Uh, uh, because it has that, that uh, image of, of, of tents and tarps. And, and we want something that's safe and secure, that is lockable. And, and by the way, I've had conversations with both my colleagues here on either side have uh, presented to our board. Uh, we are working very collaboratively with all the agencies and, and uh, we'll have continued conversations with others um, that, that uh, we are shaping this in as we go, as we listen to the advice that we're getting from these good folk. Uh, but we want to create uh, safe, secure, uh, insulated uh, little micro houses, uh, you know, 150, 200 square feet, uh, just uh, essentially a large bedroom where you can store your stuff. And more importantly, but a community that you're not by yourself. And, and so we have several people here today from uh, Dignity Village and R2D2. Just wave your hand so folks see that you are. Uh, they came down to share with us their stories, and they've met uh, with several of the counselors and the mayor, I understand. Um, they have incredible stories of, of the difference it makes when you are given an opportunity and working together and what you can do to help yourself that it doesn't always take a professional, highly paid staff person, that sometimes the community, the, the resources are already there within the community. And they are a living witness uh, to what they have done to help each other. Um, and I know there's a lot of skepticism about self-government, uh, but they are a living witness to its effectiveness. What we are trying to do in Eugene is a little bit different. We're, we've learned from their experience and much of their wisdom is included in this document. Uh, but we are using an oversight of an independent nonprofit board that's been established that, that says these are the non-negotiables. Actually, they're non-negotiables that we learn from them. Things like no alcohol, no drugs, no violence, no theft, uh, no disruption in the community. Um, and, and other than those non-negotiables, how you organize your life together is up to the community itself. And so be working with them to establish those relationships uh, and establishing their council that helps provide that direction, that organizes their security. No one will be on site who is not approved. We know who is on site at all times. So it's very important that we maintain those secure borders, of both for the security and safety, uh, as well as the well-being of the community. Uh, and what you learn from uh, uh, these folk is that uh, first of all, that they improve their neighborhood. They clean it up. They take care of the problems in the immediate neighborhood. Uh, they chase out the drug dealers. Uh, they deal with the graffiti. Um, uh, they're, they're something attractive. And, and you also learn that by helping each other that they are creating a healthier community for all of us. And uh, the great story that I didn't know until they came down, because I'd heard of R2-D2, which stands for Right to Dream 2, we all have a right to sleep, and it's in our sleep that our dreams come. And if you have to wake every 20 minutes and be moved because you don't have a place to sleep, you, you never get to dream. So uh, the right to dream, too, uh, was established 
through the folk from Dignity Village who helped to organize it and got it going. And so here is the community reaching out and expanding the services to another community. It's just an incredibly powerful story. Well, we want to capture that spirit and bring it to Eugene to demonstrate to people that not all homeless are criminals, drug addicts, yeah. uh, alcoholics, severely mentally ill. There are many folk out there on the street who are just poor. That's, that's the only thing, you know, that they don't have the means uh, and just need a little bit of help. And if we give them that little bit of help, we can change not only their lives, we change this community. We create a model that can be duplicated across the nation. And the people will look to us the same way that they look to us for the, the uh, organization building these shelters or a program like Birth to Three, the Now Parenting Now, and you know so many programs in Eugene, the, the Oregon Bot Festival, you know, that we have become known for. I truly think we have an opportunity here to create a model of which we can be proud and we can show a different face, the homelessness, um, that, that, that here are decent people that just need a chance and when we give them the chance they can rise and shine and we will be proud. So, I'm ready to ask, answer your questions.
facility of some kind uh, that would allow people to store their things so that they could go about their business is a huge need and would be uh, a great help. Um, so all of these combined, and, and, oh, and the last one that we just started two years ago is a free breakfast on Sunday morning. And when we started it, we served 75 people. We are now serving over 250 people every Sunday morning. And mind you, this is a congregation with about 250 members. I mean, we, we literally serve more people each week than we have uh, in, in the congregation. Um, and, and we were blessed uh, when we went to, we started that on a monthly basis and then went bi-monthly and then uh, several other congregations through the Oregon Faith Roundtable Against Hunger uh, joined with us uh, so that now we have five or six different congregations assisting in that effort so that we can do it weekly. Otherwise, I think it would be beyond our capacity. Uh, but we have seen just in, in the last six months a dramatic increase in, in that group on Sunday morning uh, where we're now regularly hitting over 250, whereas before it was in the, just below 200. Um, so uh, providing for uh, anything that will assist people in any of these situations will be a huge benefit, uh, but particularly that storage, uh, my concern about uh, the evening warming center capacity, and uh, for other uh, individuals, there are no other um, options out there. But I'll wear the other hat later uh, this uh, evening when we talk about the uh, Opportunity Village for Well, the good news about difficult times is that uh, it also uh, has brought a lot of the service providers together in a way that we are not used to working quite as closely. Uh, and so one of the blessings out of all of this is, is that I get to see you answer from each one. Yeah, my, my personal hope would be, first of all, that when a family comes to any one of these programs, we don't have to put them on a waiting list. And, and to have something. And actually, when we, when we started the Interfaith Emergency Shelter System, that was its intent. It was supposed to be that whole, it was the front porch of our shelter system where we were going to hold families so that we didn't have to put them on a waiting list. Now we have a waiting list to get into the porch. You know, and, and it, it's really a, 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 a tragic situation. When I, when I was ta talking to William Wise, Harry might be able to say more about this, the, the 19 or 20 families they had on their waiting list, when they had a spot open, they couldn't even find some of them because they don't have a telephone that works or, you know, Know, who knows what the situation is, and, and, and if you can't get in touch with them when you've got an open spot, and you know they're out there somewhere, who knows where. I mean, it's that's a, just a huge tragedy. But I want to speak to a second issue, and, and this really came home to me today when we we had a wonderful delegation here for the last couple of days from Dignity Village and Right to Dream Two in Portland, and, and one of the gentlemen just very articulate, well spoken, and told his story of how being a single man out there trying to get help and couldn't find any. It wasn't until he got arrested and got an addiction and got a mental health problem that he could finally get the help he needed. Uh, you know, and, and it was that kind of thing that there was help for someone in this situation, but not in that. And what we've discovered is that there's just, and I see this in my office, people who are fairly high functioning, they're just poor. That's the only, that's it, they're just poor. And, and they don't have, and many times they've got a little bit of income, especially disability income, but it's not enough. And, and, and they can't pay you $400 rent on a $650 income. And then they get in trouble, and they get arrears in their rent, and then they get kicked out. Um, in fact, I had one person who got red flagged in one of our shelter programs because he wasn't able to pay the rent in that program. Uh, not in a shelter, but in a transitional program where he was expected to pay rent. And, and so, and, and now his rent history is wrong. So um, finding those resources to help those people, and this is what we'll talk about later, who, who have the capacity to do things for themselves, but they just need a little bit of help, uh, I think is, is going to be the next challenge for us once we get the, the 